welcome to today's episode. Today I have Cornelia Shipley, who is a leadership strategist and the best-selling author of Design Your Life, How to Create a Meaningful Life, Advance Your Career, and Live Your Dreams. Cornelia, thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me, Jen. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to talk to you too, because not only have you written a book, which is something I want to ask some questions about, because I know a lot of people, including myself, um, who are entrepreneurs and freelancers that I've talked to in the last year, want to write a book. So you have done something a lot of people want to do. That's excellent. But I also love it that you have gone from corporate to being an entrepreneur and now corporations hire you. Is that right? That's right. That's okay, right. great. So can you explain a bit about your business and how you got from your corporate job to your own business that you have now? Absolutely. So the business is called 3C Consulting. We are a leadership development firm and we specialize in a couple of things, executive coaching, leadership development programming that's typically customized in organizations, strategic planning, and internal coach training certification and capability training. So that's what we do. And um, we also wind up about serving about 10 to 12 entrepreneurs in our business a year. We open um, a couple of spots up on my calendar on an annual basis for me to actually do some work with other entrepreneurs. Um, and so that's always a great way for me to stay current as to what the challenges of small business owners like myself are. Mm -hmm. um, but I started the business very similar to many women in corporate who are in a position where something happens in their life and they need to make a change. In my life, it was that I was living 1,500 miles from home. My hometown is Detroit, Michigan, and I was living in Albuquerque, New Mexico. While I got the, I had the, I was in the right job right? You, you're getting set up in the career path and you're in the right job. And in the middle of that job, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer and my father had a stroke and I'm, at the, and I'm the only child. And I wasn't married at the time. And I was like, well, this is no longer going to work because, you know, you need trains, planes, automobiles, hail signals, all of that to get back to Detroit <laughs> from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And so I was really clear that I wasn't going to be able to do that any longer. And so, um, you know, my employer at the time was wonderful and we figured out what was going to be the right thing for me and my family and for the business because there was some transitioning happening at my facility. We navigated through that. And I moved home to support my parents um, and outsourced all of my financial needs and started my business. And um, literally at my last day in corporate was October 31st. I started working with my first client, November 14th. Mm, what year was that? Uh, 2006. Oh, okay. That's been quite a while then. Yeah. Yeah. 2006. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of times the executives that I work with are at a crossroads where they're asking themselves, what does it mean for me to create meaning in my life at this point? And um, it's why I find so many women in particular are making the decision to leave corporate to go start something on their own. Mm -hmm. I see that a lot too. Yeah. Actually, this podcast slash business that I'm in started with uh, me as a special needs mom, not being able to keep a regular job because of the needs of my daughter. I mean, it started yeah. in, in my pregnancy. I had a very difficult high-risk pregnancy oh, wow. more than all the time I had off and then needing to go, I'd have to have gone back in six weeks and my daughter wasn't ready by any means. Yeah, so. yeah. no, I get that. And I think a lot of us in this, um, sort of in the general age group that we're in, we really have the sandwich generation right now. If, if you have any special needs for your children or a spouse who's maybe been injured or been in the military or something like that, and then our aging parents, a lot of us have boomer parents. So it's kind of, it's a difficult time to have a job with no flexibility. That's right. And you know this because, we, you know, when we were chatting earlier, we were talking about the fact that both of our spouses are in the music industry. <laughs> and, you know, in my case, um, my husband has the potential, and this is why we live in Georgia now. Um, mm -hmm. He looked at me one day and said, I want to move to Atlanta because it's going to be better for the business. And so when I started this business um, 11 years ago, I wasn't, I didn't even know my husband, but I started it with the intention of being a trailing spouse and because I worked in human resources what I knew was we acted let me say that differently we didn't act like 
we were clear that uh, we needed our person in the location we needed them there and we were going to move their family to do that and i didn't want to ever have to debate with my spouse about whose career was more important or mm -hmm. how we were going to make a decision about whose career we would follow mm -hmm. and so when i designed the business the only time i don't i have any place to be is when i'm going to be on a stage or facilitating at a client the rest mm -hmm. of the work I do, either literally like we're doing it right now over Skype or some other, you know, electronic medium, or I do 99% of my work over the phone. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense for a lot of people these days. I mean, yeah. location independence is so desirable. Yeah. And I know for most of uh, the last 14 years, my husband and I ran a, a ranch, which was the opposite of that. Yes. <laughs> the yes. most location dependent thing ever. It was so hard to leave. Right. Yeah. Right. There's no, I mean, it, c cows and pigs <laughs> and everything else that needs to be milked and eggs that need to be gathered have to be gathered every day. And somebody has to be there to, to process that. And so when you start a business, you have to be thinking through your intent for your lifestyle on the front end, as yeah. well as the way you're going to get out of the business on the back end. You have to design it the way you're intending to run it over the course of the time, or you wind up having to make sweeping course corrections in the middle of your business, which can sometimes be really painful. Yeah. You know what? I think that leads into your book really well, doesn't it? The designing. Yeah. So tell us some, how, how the book works and how you work with people to do this kind of thing. Because I think yeah, a lot so of us, I've fallen into a lot of things that I've done. I've had somebody tell me I'm really great at something or something come up and someone asked me to do something for them. And then think, oh, well, this could, this could be something without, I've rarely made the kind of plans that I imagine um, you help people with. So I would love yeah. to know. Oh, absolutely. So the book is called Design Your Life. And um, I wrote it. Um, the book actually started in 2003. So it didn't get published till 2014. Um, but it started in 2003 when I lived in Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. I was I in Melbourne for a while too. Did you? Oh my God. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's so awesome. I it. know. <laughs> so do. Um, so I was living in Australia and um, I was in graduate school at the time and I was really struck by the no worries attitude of the culture, right? And people had the ability to really kind of be present in the moment and to literally design the experience they were having moment by moment. And that really struck me in a way that I kind of hadn't expected as a result of going abroad. But we know if you go abroad, it changes your perspective forever. Mm -hmm. And so I, came, I started writing this, this concept of what would it mean, because I have an MBA in strategy, to strategically plan your life. Most people don't do that. Mm -hmm. They get guided based on what other people say that they should do. You should be a this. You're good at that. You should do this. You should do that. Or and you'll make money if you do this. Exactly. You be because you need money to support your family. So That's exactly happy. right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And so what happens is you design your life based on the shoulds of your life. And so you don't have a life you design. You have a life you should have, quote mm -hmm. unquote. And you're defining success on somebody else's terms. Hmm. So for me, if we fast forward to 2006 when I quit my job, I was like, this is not going to work. Like, I cannot be in New Mexico and try to support two parents who can't take care of each other. This is like not an option. So when I finally made that decision for six years, I was good right? I was running my business. I was supporting my parents in the midst of that. My parents got stable um, and I moved to Atlanta with my husband. Well, five days after our wedding, my mother died unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. And um, as you can imagine, that was incredibly traumatic for me and my father and my, and my husband. You know, my dad had been married to my mother for 52 years and with her for 57. So it was a huge loss. Um, there were a thousand people at her funeral. That is not an exaggeration. We, we served a thousand repast meals. That's the only reason I know that. <laughs> um, and so when that happened, it, it, that was the second time in my life where I, I was very clear that the design of my life was working because funeral leave in this country is three days. 
I was off for three and a half weeks. My business wasn't impacted. Now, mind you, I had scheduled time off because I was going on my honeymoon. So that got truncated. But Mm -hmm. in terms of of me being able to have my business, to have me be present for what mattered most to me, which was dealing with being newly married, managing the grief of my dad, managing my grief and the grief of my husband. You know, um, in the African-American community, when somebody passes away, people show up with a casserole and they want to share a story about the decedent. And that worked great because nobody came to my house because nobody knew where I was right I mean I had it was it was I I could not have planned it any better if I had tried because I got what I needed and what was necessary for my family because I designed it that way Mm -hmm. right I had a hundred thank you notes to send out for my wedding people got their thank you notes and their acknowledgments within days of each other because people kept saying what can you do to help I was like here take these thousand names and send out the cards right and so you you have to get to the place where you're willing most of us aren't willing to say what we need and we're not willing to actually honor our inner knowing about what we need right so when I got when I got back to Michigan I we flew back here to Atlanta got my dad and drove back to Michigan we we didn't tell anybody we were back in town because I knew I couldn't deal with my own grief and my husband's grief and my dad's grief and have to have people stay at the house for the funeral. Nobody stayed at our house. Not because I don't love people and I don't want to you know, commiserate with them. I didn't have the capacity to do that. But how often do we feel like we should? Well, your mom died, so you should have people stay at the house and let them come share the story. And all of that stuff that we do to ourselves that in no way is honoring of what we actually need. I think women in particular often are kind of trained not to do that because we're the caregivers and the nurturers and we take care of everybody else. But I think particularly at times like that, when you could go over your capacity to help others because you need the help yourself. Yes, you need the care and feeding. Yeah. And you have to set it up so that you get the care and feeding that you need. Yeah, that's so yeah. important. Yeah. yeah. I love that. And I love the story that you could do that because you had left left corporate and had the flexibility you needed. Though that is unfortunately lost. I hope you guys made up another trip since you didn't get your honeymoon. We point. did. We wound up actually a, a very good girlfriend of mine six months later had a milestone birthday. She hosted a huge party for 40 of her friends in Jamaica and my husband and I went, we were there for five days. Um, we have, we were, our honeymoon was to South Africa. We're intending to go back. We haven't planned that trip yet. We celebrate five years this year and we're going to go spend five days in Cancun, which will be fun. Oh, that sounds nice. And I have to ask, so I lived in Melbourne in 2002. Were you there in 2002? 2003. Oh, yeah, okay. I got we were- there. I got there January like 7th of oh, 2003. Okay. I arrived yeah. uh, in Sydney on New Year's of 2002, like going from 2001 to 2002. And we stayed most of a year while my husband was trying to immigrate. We, um, we got married the year after 9-11, obviously. So we had some immigration problems and we spent most of it in Australia. That's awesome. And I totally agree. One of the people we stayed with, um, because we were already doing music back then, we stayed with bands that we'd put out in the UK and America and one of the bands the lead singer was a lawyer Uh, she was like a legal aid lawyer she would call us up and say okay meet me at the beach at you know noon and she would take two hours off this is a lawyer right she would have her swimsuit under her dress she would just pull her dress off throw it on the towel go swimming and then dry off and put the dress back on, you know, it'd kind of be damp on her dress and go back to work. And I was like, I don't know any lawyer in the United States who could ever get away with that. Right. Who would take a two hour lunch with her friends who were visiting from overseas and would go swimming during that lunch and go back to work damp. And that would be fine. You know, that was part, that was my epitome of like the culture that that lawyers can do that. That's right. That's right. We don't, (laughs) we, we live in a, in a culture that really has done some disservice to us, right? We, we, we live in a culture that has said, have it your way right away at Burger King now, right? When you live in a, when you live in a fast food society, a fast result society, and you have reality TV giving you a standard to which you should aspire to, quote unquote, you mm-hmm. then wind up in position where you can't honor 
you know, the truth is I'd rather just go swimming for two hours. Than have the Big Mac your way. <laughs> then, then have the Big Mac your way, which winds up being, you know, the McMansion in the United States somewhere. Nothing wrong with a nice house, right? I mean, you know, you're seeing a corner of a slate wall. I mean, I get, you know, you want a nice home, um, but you wind up in a position where you keep chasing those things instead of what really makes you happy, which I, I was so honored when Marshall Goldsmith wrote the introduction to my book. And he talked about, you know, the three things people want in, in life a sense of meaning, joy, and contribution. And if you're not, if you haven't designed your life to create that sense in your own, in your own self and in your own being and in your own knowing, you get stuck and you feel dissatisfied and you feel frustrated. And the next thing you wanna go buy is only gonna make you temporarily happy. Mm -hmm. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't give you fulfillment. It gives you temporary satisfaction because our brains are designed to adjust, right? You get a new car and just about the time the new car smell wears off, which is about three weeks, you're ready for another new car. Like it, you're ready for the next shiny red object because you're used to the red object that you have. And so you've got to figure out in your business and in your work, what creates a sense of meaning and joy for you? Because that's what's going to keep you moving forward. And I do think with the contribution side of it, I know a lot of people do feel like once I get to the certain level or once I make it or once, once I can do what Bill Gates does, then I'll contribute. But you miss out all that time on, because I think that the, there've been studies that show giving someone a gift as opposed to having the cash yourself, you get more happiness out of buying the gift than buying the thing for yourself because you get That's to right. anticipate them opening it and like the That's joy right. of the interface and all those That's things. Right. Um, by waiting until you're rich to contribute in some way to, to give, uh, you, you lose all those years of getting that joy. Well, and the biggest, the biggest gift that people have to give is the gift of their presence. And most of us don't do that. Yeah. Right. We, I mean, we you live in a, a check. <laughs> right. It's like, okay, first of all, I'll write a check, but, but even in, even in our most intimate relationships, I mean, there, there's all these stories and I would invite, you know, your, your listeners and community, the next time you go to dinner, I don't care where you go. I don't care if you're in McDonald's or in a five-star restaurant somewhere. I want you to look and see how many people are not present with the person they're sitting to and sitting next to they're present with their cell phone. Yeah. Right. And so, so what does it mean to actually, the biggest gift you have is you. And yeah. we're, we're stingy with that. We don't, we don't want to give ourselves to our work. We don't want to give ourselves to our spouses. We don't want to give ourselves to our children because we're afraid of being hurt. And ultimately, you've got to be willing to take that risk to be fierce and take a risk and say, I'm willing to be vulnerable and show up and let you see the truth of who I am and have the faith and trust that you will love me in spite of that. That's in spite really of good. my, my flaws and insecurities and all of that. I am curious what this generation growing up with so many devices and distractions, what their impression of family and family time and, and their parents is going to be because while some of us, like me, I work from home, the problem is I do have an office. Like, I'm so glad when I finally made myself an official office, I can close the door. I can say I'm recording or I'm working. Nobody knock for this period of time. But the problem is I can still carry my computer upstairs. I can still take my phone, you know, to the soccer game. I can still have these things. Actually, the other day at my daughter's swim lesson, she was doing something exciting. And I, I was sitting on the side while she had the lesson. I had my suit on and we were going to swim more after. So I was ready to be for her for that but she shouted out and went mom you're not even watching and I was like oh. I put the phone down and I was like I am watching <laughs> mortified absolutely mortified I yeah I no absolutely right. you're right. trying something new and exciting and I need to be watching you so um, that's right yeah it's so it's so easy and I know I just saw the little warning on my computer telling me it's about to die so let me oh no <laughs> plug it up here before we lose connectivity. Mm -hmm. um, it's so easy to think that what's on the device is more important. I mean, my husband yells at me all the time because um, I have a very short attention span, right? And I have, to, I have to work at it. I have to work and be intentional about being present with him. And I have habits now, like 
if we go to the gym, I don't take my cell phone. So for the five minutes there and the five minutes back, we can spend those 10 minutes visiting. I don't have to look at Facebook for those 10 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we go to dinner, I leave my, per my phone in the car on a charger, right? So there are ways that you can start to, to practice so that you can be present with the other person in your life or the other people in your life. But we don't, we don't have that level of discipline. And I think the, the problem, one of the challenges for millennials, and I do some work with millennials in, in the corporate setting, mm -hmm. is that there's a, sen there's a sense that because I can have everything else now, I should be able to have my per career progression now too. Right. Mm. And so it becomes challenging for people, entrepreneurs as well, who are trying to find people to support them in their business. How do you navigate? No, you're not the, you're not in charge here. Right. Like I've hired you to do something and no, you're not, you're not the boss. You know, you might be the boss of, of yourself and your, your piece of whatever, but it, it, as it relates to my business, you're not the boss. And so sorting out how you can, can start to um, evaluate millennials and, and staff in general, because you have to do that as a business owner. At some point on the, on the progression of your business, you're going to get to the place where you have to hire somebody. And either you're going to hire a contractor or you're going to hire a full-time employee. And either way, you've got to be clear about how you do that and ensure that if you're whoever you're hiring can deliver the service you're looking for them to deliver and aren't looking to usurp you and your role. That is an interesting one. So of the businesses that I've owned, I've done more hiring and firing and HR for my kids therapy team than anyone else because it's mainly been college students. We hire both my children are girls. So we hire girls studying to go into special education. And it has been so interesting. I mean, some of it's because they graduate and move on or they have student teaching semesters, things like that. So it's not always like firing situation. More than anything, it's people not showing up is when I'm like, I say, okay, you're not welcome to come back again because he yeah. left me hanging. Right. But, um, but that is, it's been really interesting dealing with college students. And I've had a few non-college students that have stayed much longer, you know, mm -hmm. women who are here for you know, their family's here or something. So there's a more right. permanent anchor. So they seem to have more invested in a job. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's, that was a real challenge for me because I, in my roles before becoming a mom, I really had never done any hiring or firing. I mean, the, the ranch, we hire cowboys, but we had, we had seven years without a single payroll change. Wow. Out of our 14 years, there were seven years where we didn't switch. Wow. You know, yeah. Just, so, um, yeah, it's a hard thing to it's interviewing. I find it so hard to figure out how to tell from an interview what someone's going to be like long term in a mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're good. They're good questions. Um, I was reading, it might have been a Forbes article um, recently, and the question that one CEO asks all the, it was a story about um, asking um, a young man to, had he seen his mother's hands? because he had gone in and he had talked about how he had had all of this education and he'd gone on and he said, well, what did your mother, the CEO said, well, what did your mother do for a living? And he said she was a domestic. And he, he looked at his hands and his hands showed no sign of having done any kind of manual labor. And he said, I want you to go home tonight and I want you to wash your mother's hands. And he went home and he did that. And he was moved to tears. Scars. And he came and he, all the scars on her hands and the, you know, all of the aging that you could see on her hands. And he went back the next day and the CEO asked me, he said, well, what did you learn? And he said, I'm clear that I'm not here one by myself. Like I'm here standing on all of the pain that's represented in all of the scars that are on her hands. And I, I need to have that level of gratitude coming to work. And he was like, okay, you can work here. Right. So it's a question of what are you, you know, what you can, you can train for skill. You can't train for character. You can't train for character, right? Half the people who you fired, you fired because they didn't show up. That's a character issue. That's not a capability issue. Yeah. So the question becomes, how do you evaluate character so that you can then train for capability? Well, I did start telling people after a while that the, the biggest problem we have with people is no-shows. So I was like, 
it doesn't matter how qualified you are. Like if you're, if your schedule doesn't fit with my kid's schedule, obviously it's a no go, but if you won't show up, then, you know, we're done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. So I do think people's characters can change, like thinking of millennials, thinking of college students. When I think back to myself as a college student, which I, I did work through college, um, I went to a college where I went to Bryn Mawr College uh, near mm. Philadelphia. So okay. there was a fair amount of girls who just could, their parents could pay for it. And then there were those of us who had, who had, yes, uh, had to work to get through yeah. it. Yep. And the first semester, if you work, if you get scholarships and get financial aid, you have to work in the canteen, you have to work in the cafeterias. Yep. So that's your first semester is serving everyone else, which is a really interesting experience um, for, you know, first year college kids to be like, oh, like in class, I feel like we're equals, but here I'm, I'm serving you food also as a it's humility. It's, yep. and I did, I ended up working in restaurants quite a lot through college and, and after um, making food. I learned how to make food in restaurants. <laughs> I, think oh, wow. me. I mean, I think I know some, some people that I know who never worked in food service, terrible tippers. I think those of us who worked in food service, we know to tip because we yes. remember like yes. that I got a dollar and 20 people. an hour. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And you have this big table with all these and then, and they all give you a quarter or something. Yeah. And it's just like, God, that was so hard. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, we don't have, I and mean, we don't live in a, we don't live in a culture in the United States where um, humility is any way, in any way valued. It's, it's, it's deemed as um, a weakness in many cases, right? Being, you know, your people, many people equate it with being a doormat, right? That's you're, true. you're not ambitious. You're not, a, you know, you're, you're, you're subservient. You're, you know, you defer. You're, you're not, you don't have a voice. You're, you're all of these kind of negative connotations instead of really saying, you know, this person is being of service. And, and in Brene Brown terms, this person is choosing to be vulnerable. You know, it takes a strong, the, the stronger person is the person who can choose to be vulnerable, recognizing that the other person can't hurt them. You know, that's so interesting to the idea of being of service. It was something I was talking to someone about politics recently and the idea that the higher level you are in politics, the more of a servant you should be to the people. And um, just how much of a difference it makes when you look at people's past careers before they get into politics like are they people who will serve the best interest of the people or not and how much of a difference that makes not that we need to go into talking about our administration right it's there, just, well, you know it's it's, 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 you, it's an, are you politics in the united states right now is an interesting thing and i you know and party aside mm -hmm. what i'm very clear about and i actually I actually talked about this on cbs atlanta they asked me to come in and talk about navigating 45 in your workplace, regardless of what your political affiliation is. And here, here's mm -hmm. the deal. In my opinion, what, it, what, what 45 has done that is positive for our nation is it has, has people taking a stand for what they believe in. Mm -hmm. the, the challenge is people are clear, regardless of the side that you stand on, you got a long list of things you're trying to stand for. You need to pick the one and go after that and trust that somebody else has your number two thing as their number one thing. Oh, well, that's an interesting idea. I've never thought of it that way. Right, because what's happening is people are getting overwhelmed, mm -hmm. right? You know, yeah. if, if you're all about, you know, the Syrian refugees, great. If you're all about building a wall, great. Just pick your thing, right? Hard when there's so many, though. You know, women, I get it. LGBT, right. you know, there's so right. many things that... Pick, an, pick one, right? It doesn't, it, you know, is it going to be Obamacare or Trump care? Like, pick one, whatever it's going to be, take a stand on that thing and then go make that happen, right? Decide the impact, the contribution you want to be, and mm -hmm. then go do that thing. And you, but you have to trust that somebody else is going to cover your 986 issue. Somebody else has it. You know, I remember when I heard about Bill and Melinda Gates going after malaria and being like, huh, that's such a, like, it, it seems far away because malaria doesn't really happen in the United States. And I was kind of curious why. And then as I read more about it, like realizing that there was one thing they could focus on that would eliminate so many deaths 
and they picked one that they could actually tackle and an impact an impact and hopefully eradicate completely you know like polio vaccine could eradicate polio you know like you pick this one thing and really focus on it and that in that context what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me too yeah i mean they could have i mean i know they do have other initiatives but that being the big one yeah. like people will not die from malaria anymore because it's so preventable that's right and we'll implement right. Yeah, I was like, okay. So, but anyway, we've gotten a bit far afield. Back to your book and your work. I'm just going to yes. back around a little bit. So when you work with the 10 or so entrepreneurs that you work with each year, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because our audience is mainly self-employed women, freelancers, entrepreneurs, what, what does that look like? How do you help them out with, you know, designing their life? Yeah, so usually the, the, the reason women will come, women or men who are entrepreneurs come to me is because they're clear that they fundamentally don't own a business, they own a job, right? They went from having a job to being a subject matter expert about something, something and now they're in the business of providing that service. If you are, if you own a business and I don't care if it's a sole proprietorship, an LLC or S corporation, whatever it is, you are not in the business of providing that service. You're in the business of marketing that service. That's it. That's your job. Now you might do service delivery, right? Provide the product, provide the service, whatever it is, but you're in the business of marketing what you do. Mm -hmm. And most most people who own a job don't understand that and are scared about the marketing conversation. Yeah. Right. Like a lot of people like me who did not plan to exit my previous job when I was pregnant, I had never done sales. Right. I'd never been trained to do sales. I, I'm still terrified of sales. I, I wish someone would do sales for me. That's what I wish. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And you can ultimately get to a place where somebody will do sales for you. I had a call this morning with a person who we were thinking about bringing on as a business development manager. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can absolutely. And I and it doesn't matter if you have zero payroll or a thousand people on your payroll. You can hire somebody to do business development for you if it's something you don't like to do. As a business owner, you have to be clear. Uh, right. I never thought of that. That's that's such a good point. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, most business most business owners aren't in a position where they think about what is the what is the expertise I provide. If it's not that expertise, you shouldn't be doing it. So a big feels portion, like you have to put all the hats on, though. Especially when you're a one-woman show, you're like, I gotta right? Do this my social media marketing, my you know, getting myself out there, writing articles, figuring yep. out the stuff. Yep. But here's the thing, right? It's exhausting. That face you just made is perfect, right? You're like, I'm so overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start, right? You have to figure out for yourself, and for most entrepreneurs. You're going to get your business from, from networking and being in front of people. Hiding behind your computer is not the way that you grow a business. And I don't care if it's a service business, if it's a product business, unless it's an online marketing thing, right, that you can get this online marketing and have a lead generation funnel kind of situation going on, you need to be in front of people having conversations with them about what you do, how you do it, why you do it, the value of what you do. And... Um, and manage it in that way, right? My husband just came home. We, we, we have a dual, he's going to his office and he just waved hello to me. So that's what you all just saw. Um, so, so ultimately you have to be in a position where you're really clear, okay, I'm good at X. I'm not good at the rest of this, which means I'm gonna start to put an infrastructure together to delegate that. So you talked about social media. That's a communications internship for an 18 to 21 year old at, at your local community college that you give for free. Right? I mean, like, like really. They're probably you better know. at social media than I am, really. Than you are, <laughs> exactly. You know, um, you know, you need something designed. It's called Fiverr.com with two R's, you mm -hmm. know? And they do amazing stuff. I mean, I had a proposal that I got designed on Fiverr for $70. I sent them all the data. It was gorgeous. And, and, a, and a designer would have cost me several hundred dollars to do what this person did over in India for 70 bucks, right? So there's, there are all kinds of ways that you can start to 
create a team for yourself when you're a one man show. Mm -hmm. And you just have to decide, I'm going to delegate this, and then I'm going to delegate this, and then I'm going to delegate this. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can't delegate it all at once, right? When I started my business, I did everything too, you know, yeah. but now, but now I, have a, I have a team of people who can support me in everything from service delivery, right? Actually going to our clients and doing the leadership development work that we do to finding our clients, to closing our clients. You know, we have, I have an accountant, I have an attorney, I have, you know, I have all of that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes I get asked, one of the things I get asked often is, you know, who are the first couple of people you need to access as a business owner? You need a virtual assistant and you need an attorney and an accountant. Now, you don't have to hire any one of these people. You don't have to take them on as a full-time employee, but you need someone who can look over all of your contracts, someone who can look over your books, and someone who can manage the daily operations of your schedule and your administrivia so that you can go and do the work that you need to go do to really grow your business when you're starting. Mm -hmm. And you can get those people for $20 an hour, $10 an hour. From a virtual assistant perspective, you can you could go as low as, again, hiring a college kid and having it be an internship. And as long as they perform, they get their college credit, mm -hmm. depending upon where, you know, where you are in the life cycle of your business. Now, clearly, you, can't, you don't want an accounting student, you know, filing your taxes for you. I'm not trying to suggest that. <laughs> but so you do need a, you know, you need a professional who can do your accounting. You need an attorney who's going to, you know, that's going to be a bit more of an investment. But once you get your contract template down, you have it. And then if a client comes and says, I want to make a change, you can have that conversation with your attorney. But that becomes a one-off conversation negotiated as needed instead of you entering into an agreement with no contract that you can't defend later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? So, yeah. so you've got to, so, so there's this continuum of, of people who start in business and they own a job. And then at some point, the light bulb goes on and they go, oh, so I'm at capacity because there's only so many hours in a day and I can't do anymore, which means my business is stuck. And so the other reason people will come to me is because then they're interested in creating leverage, right? So you, the way you create leverage is either you leverage other people, you leverage your cash or both, right? You, that's, those are the ways you create leverage in your business. So if you're in a service business, you have to start to find other people who offer the same service as you do and leverage their time. So now we, we go from one copywriter on the team to two copywriters, right? And now I've doubled the capacity I have to service my clients. Now, mm -hmm. what that means is I have to make sure that they can write as well as I can. Mm -hmm. So that then necessitates a way to actually onboard them right back to that hiring conversation we were having earlier, you have to have some standards in place for what quality writing or quality coaching or quality consulting or quality accounting, whatever it is that you do, you have a way of evaluating that. Mm -hmm. So then you can start to create some leverage in your business. Now there's two of you. Go ahead. Well, then you'll have to change your pricing model from it being just paying you to now you paying them and That's yourself. Right. Because you're not That's just right. paying uh, you know, a follow through or a, a that's right. Them, you that's want right. to make money off of them getting your clients. That's right. And yeah. so you've got to think about the service you provide, not as a dollars for hours conversation, but as the value of what you provide. So you mm -hmm. have to you have to have some understanding of of what is commonly re referred to as value based pricing, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So so most people start off their job and they say excuse me, I made $100,000 a year, I divide $100,000 by 2080, which is what the full-time equivalency is for a full-time job, that gives me the number, what I should charge an hour. That in no way accounts for the impact of your work, the value, the transformation, the, the, the cost of the problem that you solve. There's no conversation about any of that in that kind of pricing model. And mm -hmm. there's no space for, for profitability to share the cost between what you know you charge for yourself and what you charge for somebody else that might be delivering the service. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. P people then have to figure out, well, how, what's the right infrastructure and what are the systems that I need to support having multiple people other than me in my business providing service delivery? Mm -hmm. 
And so I spend a lot of time with entrepreneurs talking to them about the systems that they need to put in place, about the infrastructure, about the technology tools that are available to them, about the processes that they need so that they can actually have people um, and the contracts that they need. I don't, you know, people are like, can we see yours? No, because I'm clear about the risk I'm willing to assume, mm -hmm. right? Everybody's business and circumstances are different, right? I, I probably in my contracts take more risk than you do because you have children. I don't, mm -hmm. right? And so if something happens, I have space to take some risk in my business that you may not have the space to, right? So you've got you've to gotta be talking with a person who can cover the risk you need to be covered. Mm -hmm. Um, and then once you get all of that infrastructure together, then you have a system to continue to create um, exponential leverage in your business, right? Um, and then people say, well, I don't, have a, I don't have a plan, right? If you, don't, if you can't predict your revenue, you don't have a business. You have a hobby, right? So, because think about it. Name Apple, Microsoft. Procter & Gamble, General Mills, they can predict every year how many boxes of whatever it is they're going to sell. If mm -hmm. you're in a services business, Deloitte, um, you know, uh, KPMG can tell you every year what the, what the business is going to do. They have a predictability model in their business. If you can't predict what's going to happen in your business, you don't have a business. Because what that means is tomorrow, if you don't do what you've been doing, you aren't going to have a client. Right. So yeah. you've got so so one of the things I wind up working with people is how do you create the infrastructure to be able to to predict that to know, mm -hmm. oh, OK, if I do this and this and this in a repeatable way, I could go if I, if I speak to a room of 50 people, 10 people are going to be interested in my services and five people will sign up for a consultation and I'll close one of them. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a repeatable system. You know, if you know, you, you talk to 20, you do business to business instead of business to consumer work, and you talk to 20 purchasing people, and you know half of them are going to, to um, do business with you, then that means every month, you know, you need to talk to 20 people to close 10 deals. That's you predictable. More, you know, right. you have and to do so many more calls, right? <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right, right? So you've got to, you have to understand your numbers in a way that can, can then drive your behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and most people don't understand that. And then the, the last thing clients will come to me for is, okay, great. So I have this business and now because I didn't design it on the front end, it owns me. I don't own it. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't matter if it's a business with employees or no employees, a business that you've had for five minutes or 20 years, either you can get to the place where you are feeling overwhelmed by the, by the behemoth you've created. And so then it's about how do you streamline the processes? You know, we literally will take a white piece of paper and say, okay, great. If we were to start over, what are the projects and products and services you would actually provide now? Mm -hmm. Right. And then we talk about, well, okay, you have this, this product that you offer, what are we going to do with that? Are you going to sell it? Are you going to license it? Are you going to just kill it? Right. And so you get to then decide and then restructure what the business actually looks like and how you engage with it going forward. That sounds amazing. And that does sound like things that a lot of the people that are kind of in my world, like I said, a lot of us end up out of the regular workforce, not because we planned it, because something happened, and then we just kind of scramble and start putting things together. So that sounds like such an amazing service. We are coming up on our time, so we're going to have to I know. wrap it up here. And I was hoping to also talk about your, since you've written a book while doing your business and working with clients, and I do see that as another thing that I know a lot of people want to do to be able to leverage their knowledge and their time. Um, do you want to... Sure. So the, 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 I'm actually in the middle of writing the second book. So I'm working on a book right now. Um, and to do that very differently than the first book I wrote, um, which took, a long, a, time, which right? took a long time. Um, I wrote my second book in 90 minutes and I used a resource called 90 minute book.com and I don't get any commission or any, I'm not saying this cause I get a check. If you go to 90 minute book.com, I don't, um, but it's 90minutebook.com. 
Okay. I'm um, going to see what that is myself because I'm curious. Nine, and is it 90 minutes at a time or you're not So seeing? 90 minutes total. So I, I, there's two, look at you, look, you look beautifully <laughs> skeptical. I love that. So, so what you actually go and do is have a conversation um, with them about whether or not you want your book to be a narrative or an interview. So this is, this is really designed for people who are subject matter experts about something okay. and want to, and so you can either break the book out into chapters and you would do that by actually presenting right? You literally actually present your content over the phone. They record it and then they send it back to you in the form of a book, which you can then edit. So they, or, are they flashing things out? Are they doing research? Are they providing footnotes? Or are they just taking exactly what you said? And they, take, it? they take what you said and they edit it for you. And then they send it back to you. And then you can add whatever pieces of it you want to add to it. So I did this, this 90 minute book process. You speak for 60 minutes, you meet with the person for 30 minutes in advance to kind of navigate it out. I got the first draft of the book and something wasn't right. Like I was kind of like, I'm not ready to, to publish this. So I got clarity in the last probably maybe five or six weeks ago about what I want to add to it. And then I have time blocked in my calendar. I have notes and I have time blocked in my calendar to get it done. I mean, I think from a productivity standpoint, the way that the, what, what gets calendar, calendared gets done if you actually mm -hmm. can learn to manage to your calendar. The mm -hmm. problem comes in the fact that most people don't put work time on their calendar. Right. I'm looking mm -hmm. at your calendar behind you. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so you we don't have appointments on. Right. We put our appointments on our calendar, but we don't put time to actually get real work done. And so, yeah, I've tried a few different calendar systems. I mean, I have the big calendar up there. You're right. That's for planning out the big yearly things. And then yep. I've used this and then I've tried Todd Herman's 90 day calendar. I just finished this 90 day one. Okay. This is one of the few ones that um, does have that on it because what it has you do is actually fill in these 15 minute increment dots yep. for the, for the projects. Not, I, I, I don't do it for phone calls and, and appointments or for podcasts because I know how long my podcast was because I can see the little right. recording minute, but I would record. So this was a, a writing project I was working on. So every 15 minute increment that I actually focused on it, Right. I used my Pomodoro app, so I would, for 25 minutes, focus, and then I got a five-minute break, and I would check on social media then. But you're right, times when I don't have it, I, I don't have my app that's telling me only focus on this for 25 minutes, and then you get a yeah. five-minute break. I am a, like, 25-tab open-at-a-time person. Yes, right. <laughs> and, and most people don't understand your brain is actually programmed to, to only have focused attention for 30, 60, or 90 minutes. We refer to that as the sitcom, the drama, and the movie. And so, oh. so if, you, if you go longer than 90 minutes, typically you're gonna get distracted, right? So you have to find where between 30 and 90 minutes is your productivity sweet spot. And then that's the amount of focused attention you should be scheduling to work on any given project. But you have to schedule that time into your calendar and then you, you and set a timer or whatever your process is to make sure you get the work done. So for me, that's I have blocks set out to, to actually go back through and add all of this additional content that I want to add to the book. And I know I have to have all of that done by a particular time because people are going to be ordering the book for free. So, <laughs> so I know, right. I, 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 that's the other thing. If, you, if you're a deadline driven person, you have to create a deadline for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have started trying to put different um, daily themes. So like Thursday and Wednesday, I do clear off big spaces in my calendar for both writing because I do a lot of articles, but I have some big book projects that obviously no one's paying me to do. Um, but I do writing Wednesday and editing Thursday because editing, I love the free writing. I love doing the like ideas part of it. I hate going back and reading my own stuff and then editing it. I just, yeah, but That's I feel funny. like it's not worth, it's not, it's not worth it to send an editor my free write because only the free write only makes sense to me. Like I really do have to go back and reshape it. Otherwise I'd be spending a fortune on editors to make sense of what I was thinking at that moment. So I like that 90 minute book idea. I'm going to go check that out because that yeah. makes a lot of sense for people who are doing a book just for their business or That's for their right. 
to go with speaking events or things like that. Yep, and then so you get a chance to choose if, if it's gonna be a content model or if it's gonna be an interview model. And so mm -hmm. the other way that the book can come back to you is actually in the form of an expert interview. Right. So someone it interview be, asking you questions. Yes, exactly. And then they record your answers, which you can then edit to, to the way that you see fit. And then that becomes your book. Fantastic. Yeah. When is your book going to be done? The new one? The new one, knock on wood, um, it will be done uh, by the end of August. Okay, great. Well, I'm August. excited yeah. about that. I'm going to put that in my calendar and circle back around because oh, I awesome. want to see what a 90 day book or 90 minute book ends up looking like once you edit it and everything. Yes. So yeah. August, end of August. Yep. End of August. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. You're You've welcome. given me a lot to mull over in my own life. You're welcome. Now that I consider myself a fully a full freelancer. I don't consider myself a business owner since we sold our business now, but, um, but yeah, I, I need to move. I think I need to shift it a little from freelancer, entrepreneur, CEO, you know, all those yep. things you were talking about. Well, I, there is a, there's a tip I will tell you is that um, people who, who make big dollars as entrepreneurs are influential people. And there, mm -hmm. there are 10 things that, that they all do. And I will offer you an opportunity, should you be so interested, if you go to CorneliaShipley.com, you can go and get uh, the 10 practices of very influential people. Um, and you'll also wind up getting a bunch of tips from me on a monthly basis about leadership and about how to be in the world. This, the one that went out this week talks about how to navigate yourself in the conversation around 45 in the workplace, right? So, so there's all kinds of really kind of interesting tips that wind up coming out okay, every perfect. month. Yeah, I will go check that out. And you guys should all go check that out too. I'll put a link to Cornelia's website. And that sounds like the main place to go your website. Yep. We'll that's make right. sure you book and everything as well too. Well, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Jen. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.